Hello. Oh, okay. Hello. <laughs> Someone's awake. All right. Um, so hi, I'm uh, I'm Ming Nguyen. Um, I don't know why they put me on this giant stage because this is actually a personal talk. But all right. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, sometimes I get to thinking that Open Historical Map is um, like really special, something truly unique. I mean, after all, it's the next frontier of OpenStreetMap, uh, which is the most mappy map in the world, right? Well, we're not that special, you see. Um, we're actually operating in a crowded playing field, um, competing for mindshare with um, established academic initiatives, very slick commercial uh, project, uh, products, and even some weird alt history projects. Um, all the good domain names have already been taken, and so we've resorted to, to the blandest, most functional name possible. Uh, but when I think about all, like, all about what makes OHM OHM, all these other projects only tick some of the boxes. You know, the, the academic project is really about getting academics to share their work, great, but the rest of us are just spectators. Um, that slick commercial product doesn't really want you to know what their terms of service are, um, and, uh, and don't get me started about the cookie notices, um, and none of these other projects really care about local knowledge like we do. Now, to be fair, uh, we've got a long way to go too. Um, yes, technically we have a world map, but as you can see, uh, our data is concentrated into a stereotypically small part of the world. Um, you might, in fact, notice a resemblance to OSM's areas of strength, Central and Western Europe, plus a United States that looks suspiciously like someone imported it. Hey. <laughs> I didn't say anything bad about that. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and you know, if you dare to zoom way into an area that you're familiar with, uh, no, don't adjust your television set. This is the average OS, uh, OHM uh, coverage in most of time and space. Nothing. Uh, this is what it means to be an early adopter, a pioneer. But enough about OHM. Uh, time to talk, talk about me. Uh, so I've gotten this question a lot. Uh, where are you from? Now these days I usually say San Jose. Uh, you might have heard of a smaller town to the north called San Francisco. Um, but sometimes that isn't good enough. No, I mean, where are you like, from from? Okay, so I was born in a Walmart parking lot. Uh, well, no, actually I was born in this hospital, but then it changed names and ownership a few times. Then Hurricane Katrina swept through, the hospital was abandoned, and then finally Walmart took over. So I was born in a Walmart parking lot. Um, today, there's no trace left of that old hospital in New Orleans East. There's no trace of it online either, except in OHM. I only care about this because I have a connection to this place, and you only care about it because you're stuck in this room with me. <laughs> now, if you'll indulge the life story a little bit more, I grew up in a small town of about 10,000 um, called Loveland. True to the name, this town has more houses of worship than traffic lights, I counted. Uh, I got my start in OHM by mapping all of them, all the churches and all the traffic lights, uh, and after, after many years, I felt that I had just just about run out of things to map, other than the like, minutia of roof shapes and mailboxes. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, mapping has always come hand in hand with a certain curiosity about the world. Um, you, you know the slide. This is the slide, that, the, 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 the critical thinking uh, skill that they teach in the first grade. Um, and uh, OSM is very good at the what and the where. Uh, yes, there, you know, there is the thing and the thing is, is here. But why is it here? Why is it like that? Who put it there? OSM leaves the rest of the W's to the imagination. So my school bus used to go down the main drag of, uh, of Loveland every day. And as a kid, I noticed that that little alley in front of the green building there um, is named uh, Greer Militzer Place. That always got me thinking, like, what an odd name. Who names their kid Greer? Now, I had to know more about this person and why they have an alley named after them. So um, looking through old archives of the local newspaper, um, turns out George Militzer ran a clothing store upstairs at this building overlooking City Hall for many years. Uh, Greer was his nickname. Um, he was remembered fondly for his charity, and now his store is in OHM, another breadcrumb for the curious. Well, I can't just add one shop. If I'm going to add shops, I better commit to it. Uh, so I searched the newspaper archives for addresses along this block and found references to loads of shops that have come and gone over the years. Uh, here's the web, uh, so on the, the green box there, that's um, the website for one of these shops that was uh, no longer around but preserved in the Wayback Machine. Uh, so thank you, Internet Archive. Um, it gives a tantalizing clue to yet another shop that came before it. 
um, Sparks Hardware was the first women-owned hardware store in the United States. So despite living in Loveland for many years, I had no, no clue about that. It was just pure serendipity. And as I went through mapping the churches, like I had an OSM, there was this one church that always intrigued me, um, sitting at the end of Chestnut Street, um, on the other side of the railroad tracks. I, I could never quite tell if it was an active worship space. It, it looked abandoned. And in fact, the city took it over uh, at one point and left it to rot with the intention of demolishing it. So in its defense, a local magazine published an oral history um, noting its importance as a focal point of what used to be um, the local black community. And this was uh, surprising to me because living there, I, I knew Loveland as a town that had always been lily white, um, somewhere where someone like me stuck out, um, and that's just how it always been. Um, but my side of the railroad tracks used to be a black community. Where did they go? So sometimes mapping history turns up more questions than answers. You see a pattern here. Um, if I had just stuck to mapping OSM in increasing detail, uh, I would be able to, you know, I would be able to regale you with the roof shapes of these buildings, the opening hours of their shops, etc. But I'd miss the most important thing about them: the people and their stories. So, if a small town like Loveland has a lot of unanswered questions, imagine um, what I face now that I live in San Jose, a city of almost a million with a much more dramatic history. So, back in January at Mapping USA. Um, I told you about a new park in my neighborhood and the story behind it of the Chinatown that racist neighbors burned to the ground and the courage, that, uh, the courage of a German immigrant who built them a new San Jose Chinatown. After I gave that talk, the OSM China community accused me of fabricating the Chinese name for San Jose in San Jose Chinatown. Uh, in their reckoning, the three characters at the top here um, actually mean throw them away, uh, which is a most unlikely name for a city. Now, I don't speak any Chinese, but I believe they missed a subtle point, um, that the residents here didn't speak Mandarin. They spoke Toisanese, which, is, uh, which um, was a once dominant dialect in North America that today is in decline. So they probably wouldn't have heard of it. This is such a minor detail on the map, yet it surely mattered a great deal to the people who lived there at the time. Like OSM, OH OHM excels at the little surprises, the invitations to learn more. The reason we remember Highlandville today is not because something bad happened there, but rather because there people were able to live out normal lives. The, the mundane history with a lowercase h is important to document, because without it, we can't relate as well to history with a capital H. Uh, this is an excerpt from a paper in the journal Historical Archaeology, um, talking about the need to document lowercase history using the methods of archaeology. You too can be an ar amateur archaeologist. On any given day, you might find me roaming the streets of San Jose looking in search of um, more clues to add to the map. This is the traditional way of contributing to, open, uh, to OpenStreetMap, uh, and it's equally valid for Open Historical Map. There are historical clues everywhere if you look closely enough. Um, so, like for, for example, for decades, anyone building a sidewalk would have stamped it with their name in the year. They literally made their mark on the city. In a residential area, these sidewalk marks help us ascertain not only when the sidewalk, sidewalk itself was built, uh, but also the age of the houses along the street, something that it's, it's very hard to find another data source for. This mark should be familiar to anyone, um, to any students of American history. The Works Progress Administration built this sidewalk and the park it's in. Uh, now, just to be clear, you don't need to be a city or a federal contractor to leave hints for uh, um, armchair historical geographers. Uh, this sidewalk was apparently marked by a kid in, uh, in 97. Cute, huh? Um, it's etched in stone, and that's good enough for me and, and for the on-the-ground rule, so it's good enough for me. Uh, these days, whenever I patronize a mom-and-pop restaurant or some other small business, I always make sure to ask how long they've been around. Um, they're always uh, eager to tell you th about that and their whole, uh, their whole life story, it seems. Um, it's not awkward at all. It's actually really cool. Um, because they are lowercase. They're the little guys, the insignificant people in, in, in world history. No one ever bothered to map their history until OHM came along. So uh, some of you saw me slip into the sandwich shop on Thursday after the social. Um, their start date, March of last year. So um, this is just a small slice of the sources that you can pull together in your own research to make a historical map. Yes, you can copy prior art such as old maps, but you can also leverage any of the, the sources that you cite for a research project on the subject. Throw in a field survey like I do, um, corroborate it with an oral history or someone reminiscing on social media, and you're golden. 
There's a fourth category that we can call data exhaust. Um, that's uh, records that are gathered for purely non-historical reasons, but you know, if they have timestamps and addresses, that's, that's what we need. Um, and finally, sometimes we're actually able to fill in the blanks um, by inference without compromising the map's credibility. So, here is 229 uh, years of Loveland history flashing by. Hopefully you can see it. Um, it's woefully incomplete, but already it's more than anything anyone has ever done to visualize the town's history. So we're about to reach the 1960s, boom, everything starts filling in because this became a suburb of Cincinnati. And there you go. So that's 229 years. All right, and thank you. It's, it's always fascinating to learn about history and connecting maps, uh, maps back to people, so thank you very much for that. Are there any questions? What have you guys done to try to get anything with a start date that's in OSM into OHM? Um, so you're talking, this is like features in OSM that already have start dates or Correct. that, okay. Um, so if you're looking at a feature in OSM just in general, um, the issue with bringing it over to OHM is going to be, first of all, the license. Um, OSM has the ODBL and um, I think just as a best practice, um, it's best to, you know, to be conservative in terms of what you bring over from OSM so that you don't, um, that you're able, you know, you're, you're able to respect the ODBL, right? Um, but if it's something that you've uh, created yourself in OSM, feel free to bring it over to, to OHM. Um, it's clunkier than it should be right now for technical reasons. We're, we're working to make that, that easier. Um, but uh, in general, anything that you bring into OHM should have a start date unless it's something like, you know, natural, we're talking about like the continent, you know, Pangea or whatever. Um, but, uh, you know, if it's like a railroad building, whatever, um, make sure it has a start date. And I think that alone means that in many cases, you'll probably find it easier to just map it from scratch. And that's okay too. Um, that's what I've done a lot of times um, in my own mapping. Hope that answers your question. Any others? Yes. We're, we're, get, we're gonna get the, yeah, sorry. What's your favorite quirk of Loveland history? Oh, well my favorite quirk of Loveland history actually can't be mapped even in an open historical map. It's uh, this like, um, this uh, tale in the 1970s about uh, the Loveland frog. Um, it's like a giant humanoid frog that, uh, that um, some police officer said they, they, they encountered. Um, I, I guess I, I, haven't, uh, I, I haven't mapped that yet. Um, although, uh, if, if anyone ever does erect a, uh, a memorial to that, that frog, I'm definitely going to map it. Um, yeah, I hope, hope that answers your question too. <laughs> if you can track down the history of the frog, we do have the new event schema. We have time for one last question, if it's a short one. If not, that thanks again. Right. It was a great presentation. Thanks, everyone.